Hi, welcome back. Um, I'm Ashley Miller, assistant instructor here at the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm joined by Eric. Hi. And uh, we are here to talk again about rhetorical appeals. Um, we've spoken with you already about ethos, and today we're going to talk about pathos, um, which is also referred to as an emotional appeal. So Eric, when you introduce ethos to your class, what do you tell them? Well, you know, pathos does appeal to emotion. So love, hate, like, dislike, really any sort of sensation or feeling you can have towards something, we're dealing in the realm of pathos. So you see this a lot in commercials that want you to give money, right? Give money to children who don't have enough food, right? And they use pictures that are supposed to evoke in you feelings of sympathy, feelings maybe of guilt. And the idea there is that the this emotion will have an intended effect on you, the effect of giving money, right? So you know what the emotional appeal looks like. I always think about those Sarah McLaughlin videos for the ASPCA with the sad dogs the and the sad music. They Absolutely. make me feel very sad. Absolutely. And like I should help the dogs. Absolutely. Right? So you know when people are trying to tug at your heartstrings or trying to make you angry. You know when emotion is being used on you, right? So I, I think that that sort of pathetic appeal, pathos appeal, it's pretty obvious. What I like to tell my students is that it's really more than that, though. It's, it's, it's any sort of value or belief, really any sort of intangible thing that an author wants you to conceive or that an author is trying to share with you. So patriotism. Patriotism is not an emotion, but it's clearly a pathos appeal, right? So if you go to a 4th of July picnic and there's red, white, and blue, and there are fireworks and everybody's singing God Bless America, those are clearly pathos appeals. But they're not appeals to emotion, even though you may feel happy to be there, or you may feel full after eating too much, right? It's, it's really an appeal to patriotism, to national pride. So that's, I think, the thing I really want students to walk away with, is that pathos is more than emotion, right? It includes emotion, but it also includes and, and it's really more interesting when it's used for beliefs, religious beliefs, or scientific beliefs even, right? Um, values, right? Okay, so this is what we're talking about when we're talking about pathos. Anything that doesn't really fit in the ethos realm or doesn't really fit in the logos realm, we're sort of dealing with, with pathos. Sure, and I think, again, if you keep in mind everything you learned in Unit 1 about communities and the ideologies they hold, um, it will help you to analyze these texts and to understand when an author is playing on a belief or a value that a community might have. Um, particularly when we talk about the DREAM Act, um, patriotism I think is a perfect example. It comes into play a lot in these debates about the DREAM Act. Um, what is American? How do we define American? Um, so these values that, that audiences hold and that authors hold, they come into the realm of pathos very frequently. Absolutely. So somebody's talking about not just values, but shared values. So a writer's trying to anticipate what his or her intended audience will value, or what values they may share, right, that are mutual. And they try to highlight those in their essays or in their writings, okay? It wouldn't make sense for a writer to try to convince people who um, are anti-war that going to war was a good idea, right? Those are different, they don't share a value. Okay, they, So you would have to take a different tact. If you were pro-war and you wanted to convince or talk to a group of anti-war people, you could still do it, but you probably wouldn't try to do it through sharing a value. Okay, It's not going to work. And that's um, great advice for you to keep in mind as you work on paper three at the end of the semester, your synthesis essay. Again, when you make your own argument to an audience, you will possibly be exercising some appeals to pathos, um, to values and emotions. and you'll want to consider then what values your audience shares um, and how your own values might match up with that. Absolutely, absolutely. For now though, when you're doing the rhetorical analysis, what we're asking you to do is, well, I, I, the advice we've given you in earlier videos, which is to think about the intended audience. You've selected an article from the reading packet and you're really starting to deconstruct and analyze and explain the content and structure of that argument, what it's saying and how it says it, right? Pathos is one of the ways that it would say, it's one of the how it says it sort of strategies. And what you're looking for there is if you've isolated the intended audience and you know that this author is writing towards this particular audience, you should have a better sense about why they would include this sort of pathos. 
Um, so we think you probably have a pretty good understanding of how things like fear or sympathy work in an argument um, as appeals to certain feelings. Um, we'd like to show you an example now of how you can see pathos functioning in terms of an appeal to values um, and to some common shared sense of belief and value. So we're going to step out of the frame and pull up um, an article that you've already read before, um, source number one, in fact, in your reading packet, Bay Buchanan's article. Um, and we're going to look at the way she is appealing to certain values of her audience members and what that looks like. Great. All right, so here is the article. Again, you can follow along. You should have this um, from the previous unit. But um, what's first important to understand about Bay Buchanan's values and her audience's values, um, as I'm sure you've investigated in the first unit, she's a very conservative writer. And she's coming from a Republican conservative position. Oftentimes, um, the Republican stance on immigration is much less open. Um, it's more of a belief that we should focus on America, people who currently live in America, how can we help them? and leave the people who don't currently live here and aren't residents um, out of the picture. So that's something to keep in mind when we look at this, this argument. Um, one thing that I've noticed here, and I've gone ahead and bolded a couple of places where she's done this in her argument, is Bay Buchanan starts with an intense focus on children. Um, and she starts by assuming that her audience is a group of people who care about the needs of children. That, that could be a sympathetic sort of response from people that they think, well, I want to help children and children are great and they're innocent and they have so much opportunity ahead of them. And what Buchanan does here is she starts with that value and if her argument here is that the DREAM Act should not be passed, what she's trying to do is to divorce that value from the DREAM Act. She's trying to say if people think that we should help children, and I don't want the DREAM Act passed, I need to separate the idea that children will be helped from the DREAM Act. And what you can see her doing with her rhetoric then is starting with this idea, and then as you scroll down and you can look towards the second half of her argument, um, which we will see momentarily, is that her language moves from the language of children to a much more dehumanized, impersonal view of illegal aliens. And this phrase, illegal aliens, is something that as you look through the rest of the article, you will see appear again and again and again. She's taking this value that people have, and she knows that if people feel sympathy towards children, they might feel sympathy towards the DREAM Act. So her rhetoric is very pointedly tearing the DREAM Act apart from children and trying to argue then to her audience that this is not an act to help children, it's an act to help illegal aliens. Which, if you look at these two words, they're very dehumanized, they have sort of a negative tone with illegal. Aliens aren't even um, always you know, human beings. If you saw that movie Cowboys and Aliens over the summer, you might you know, remember these extraterrestrial attachments we have to this word. Um, so I think here we see a great example of how a rhetorician manipulates language in order to reach different parts of their audience. Um, and if, in fact, you have your packet in front of you, you can look at the very next article for an exactly opposite approach to um, people's values and the DREAM Act. Rather than attaching the DREAM Act to illegal aliens over and over and over, we see here Arnie Duncan in his article is associating the DREAM Act with, um, in paragraph two, hard working patriotic young people. Look at how that language is so different from illegal alien. Young people appeals again to an audience's sense of humanity um, and taps very deeply into the sense that, that viewers will all share of the American dream. If you work hard and you're young, you can build up a future for yourself. So Arnie Duncan is appealing to an audience that values the American dream and that believes that people do deserve opportunities to make better lives and that they can successfully make those lives. Um, you know, he does it, you can read this on your own, you'll see it happening over and over, these bright, talented youth unleashing the full potential. Um, he even has a line in paragraph four where he references values that all Americans cherish. Again, these ideas of 
we all think that it's great to work hard and achieve success. Um, so I think, you know, hopefully through these two examples, you get a great sense of how Duncan and Buchanan are using different appeals to emotion to kind of align their audiences with their positions, either against, as we saw with Buchanan, or for, as we see here with Duncan through now. We'll get the lights back. Hopefully through those examples, you've gotten a little better sense of what it means not just to think about pathos in terms of feelings, um, which is certainly one way to look at it, but also to think about the values that, that authors will dig into, and they can be so powerful I think, in making an argument. Very, very powerful. And, and again, all three of these appeals are going to occur in most everything you read. It would be rare, if not impossible, for an article or a book or a film or a speech or a song to not have a little bit of logos, a little bit of pathos, a little bit of ethos, right? Pathos is particularly common. Pathos is, is particularly common, but it's not always the most prevalent. So you got to be careful to avoid the instinct to always call something pathos. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to the video on logos. Um, but for now, Pathos, the appeal to emotion and to values and to beliefs, particularly those shared between the author or writer or speaker and the audience, his or her audiences. Okay, so as you go through the analysis, that's what you're trying to describe. What's shared, right? What is that writer trying to share? All right. Good we'll luck. See you next time.